All right, so welcome everyone to uh, another episode of Light Painting Live. Um, this is the March edition. Um, tonight we've got Johnny Griffin back with us. He's going to be doing another uh, Light Painting Brushes uh, tool tip segment. Um, we've got Tim Gamble from the UK, um, brand ambassador with Light Painting Brushes. We've got Dan Roberts in Colorado. Uh, he's going to be talking about mosaic light painting and some of the projects he's doing that other people can join along and and participate with so there's a lot of good stuff there um we've got a, a, a so great great guest this evening and I, I i'm pretty excited for uh for this this live event um so we'll start off with uh tim gamble we're going to go ahead and do a breakdown with him i'm going to share my screen here real quick all right so this is the uh the image that we selected uh, to break down with Tim. So Tim, welcome, man. Uh, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Tim. <laughs> this is my <laughs> image. <laughs> How are you? You all okay? Doing great. You know, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I've always been a huge fan and admirer of your work, as many other people from around the world have. So um, just what you do, man, is, is really appreciative and, and really, really inspiring stuff. I just just want to personally tell you that, and and so it is definitely a pleasure to have you here this evening. Right, it's very kind of you, mate, and it's a pleasure to be here with you all as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, um, so the first thing about this image, um, uh, where is this located? Like, what what brought you to be here to this location um, for this particular image? Well, this uh, this is one of mine and Chris Thompson. So Fast Chris is his name, his artist name. Um, go here regularly. This place is called Padley Gorge. Um, so it's this we like this place be, not only because it's a beautiful place to go, but because it's sort of equidistant between where he lives and where I live. He's from Sheffield and I'm from Manchester, and we've got the Peak District right slap bang in the middle of the pair of us. So it, it makes sense from that perspective for us to meet there and if you ever went there you'd realize why because well to be fair in this particular and you can't really see a right lot of it it could have been anywhere that was foggy but then <laughs> um, right. yeah, it, is, it is amazing so it's called Padley Gorge in the Peak District um, and we, we picked this particular place because it's got in this particular area there's all these boulders running through like a tunnel of trees that are all covered in moss and then the trees that are there are called Cecil Oaks. And they're all sort of, you can just see in the picture there on the right and on the left, how sort of gnarly and twisted they are. So it's all, it's a bit like Middle Earth out of uh, Lord of the Rings, really. It's a, it's a really beautiful place. What was this, uh, was this a plan? Was it a planned camera rotation when you, uh, when you saw this location? You know, what, what inspired um, to do a camera rotation here? Well, I've I've done lots of camera rotation shots from here. Uh, I mean, the initial ones were definitely inspired by TCB, like Dana Maltby. His work is like massively inspiring to me. Um, I think all of the kinds of light painting that I enjoy looking at can all probably be traced back to stuff he was doing about 10 years ago, sort of thing, on his own in a tunnel. So... Uh, yeah, um, but here I've done camera rotation shots before, but this one wasn't particularly planned. It was a, just sort of a freestyle evening. I'll start with camera rotation of me in the tunnel of trees, and then it just sort of built up from there. Um, do, do you remember what the settings were or the gear that you that you used for this shot? Uh, well, my camera is a Sony A7 II. Uh, with a Nikon stroke Nikon 20 mil lens on there. Uh, it was ISO 100, a manual white balance, and 413 seconds to be exact. So I had two tripods for this one. Um, one, so I, I start off by lining up the camera rotation with the human form, so a 180 flip of that. Once I'm happy with where the figures fall on that element of it, then I'll move on to the, the middle segment, um, which is was created using 
the Serpent Blade from Johnny Griffin there. Thank you very much once again. And what I do with that is I attach it. So this is a tripod. And on top, I've mounted a clamp. So what I do is I attach the blade to the clamp and undo this knob here on the tripod. Let me move back a bit. So I'm able to rotate. Can you see? You can kind of see. So I, I rotate this once and then Chris with the camera rotation tool rotates that, rotates the camera and then I rotate the blade again, and rotate the camera and then I make sure that the middle part of the of the rotation doesn't interfere with the silhouettes um, that I'd already created. Um, and then basically, so I, I, I focus on the blade to begin with and then I refocus the camera again for the silhouettes. And then the bit that goes around the edge is just me basically stood there with the blade, just moving it up and down and up and down so I'll like count at one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Stood off to the side of the image frame whilst Chris is just constantly rotating my camera around and around in time with what I'm saying. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that, that's basically how that was created. Um, do you... Do you do you prefer the, the planned images or, or do you do you like it just completely uh, random creation? Because it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of well, planning I, that goes into with, well, with the uh there used to be. I used to think and plan sort of everything out to like the minutest detail, but that takes a lot of time, like a lot of mental time just in my free time, just thinking about images and how I'm gonna create them. Whereas this one, I started off with just the silhouettes in a 180 flip. And then I decided that, well, the middle of the frame is lacking interest and the outside of the frame is lacking interest. So I knew that I would be able to do the blade rotation for the middle and the outer to fill those elements. And that would tie in nicely with the, the flip silhouette sort of uh, just on either side of the blade rotation in the middle. So the, the blade rotation in the middle, that is, that's definitely inspired by, uh, there's a chap called Chris Searle, who's from the UK as well. He did an awful lot. I mean, he's not done anything for a little while, but back in the day, he was doing lots of blade rotation stuff that was so clean and precise. It really looked computer generated. It was that perfect right. and precise. Uh, so he was he was definitely an inspiration for that because I saw his images and I, I didn't ask him how he created them. I kind of wanted to work it out myself. And I, I think what I've just described, I don't know if that's how he does it or if he uses a lazy Susan, I'm not too sure, but that that was what where my thought process led me to for the for the central right. moment. The I uh, you know one thing about your work too there is a lot of symmetry so you've gotten really good with these camera rotations and creating the symmetry um, that's just beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm you know and with that with the next question do you have any suggestions or you know important point in pointers for others that would like to try camera rotation and mm -hmm. you know incorporate that into their own work. Well, I used to be, before I do what I do now, I used to be a tiler. So I was all right. about the symmetry. <laughs> it had to be symmetrical or I wasn't happy. Um, but I mean, th my rig is this one, which was made by Chris and his brother. Sadly, <clears throat> they don't make them anymore. But I was just in conversation uh, like a couple of weeks ago with Ryan, Ryan O'Connell, uh, Digi who was like a massive, like huge inspiration of mine from when I first started out. Um, and he was like quizzing me on camera rotation and he'd found just, uh, um, it's actually a pano head. 
off um, off eBay. I think it was about eighty dollars. I think he paid for it. I'm not too sure, but it's basically off, pretty much as makes no difference. The same as this, you can do the same things with that. Um, and yeah, he's he's sort of hit the ground running um, with his, and yeah. Uh, so it, I mean, on there's a camera rotation Facebook group on Facebook. Um, and at the top of that, I think there's a sticky post that by Jules Boo, um, who created his own camera rotation tool with off-the-shelf products, so an indexing rotator and a few brackets that you can attach your camera tr- to. So, uh, or I have a friend who has who's talented and has a talented welding brother who can knock right. you some up like this. So, like Johnny Griffin, I'm sure would be able to. Uh, knock these out for fun so right. yeah and uh, and what well, i i, I yeah, don't uh, go, Dan, got some yeah to go with, always with stuff like this i'd always suggest i was saying it to you earlier just go and look at the optical nirvana group on Flickr because that that that's where i used to get all my and still do get all my inspiration from on there because there's an awful yeah. lot of shots on there that'll make you scratch your head and that's what I'm into is is looking at pictures that make me think, how on earth have, have they created that sort of thing? And there's a lot of camera rotation stuff there, especially from TCB back in the day and LED Eddie uh, and Matt Barris and Chris Thompson as well. Um, so, yeah, it's go, go and have a look on there because it, it just, it, it's just mind-blowing and really beautiful oh. at the same time. In, in your in your image here, they were were breaking down um, the lighting. Like, are you p- positioning the lighting and staging it before the exposure? Uh, in per- you know, like the light be- behind um, your sub. Yeah, your yeah. So that, that's like, that's like, that's me. In the dark? So that's me okay. in the image. So what we tend to do to start off with is I'll plunk my camera down, and I know the boulder that I'm stood on. I'll always put that on the bottom third of the frame, bottom left hand third of the frame. And then I get my BLF Q8 torch, which is just a beast. I'll stick that on a light stand. I'll walk to the very back of like this tunnel of trees, put it on a light stand, aiming towards the camera. And then I'll make my way back to the boulder. And then I can see from that boulder where my shadow is hitting the camera. So if I can see my camera, I'll know that the light behind me is visible. So I'll just make adjustments and move myself a bit because you don't really want the backlight to be visible to the camera because it'll just blow everything out. And on this particular evening, I'd seen on the weather report that it was going to be foggy. So I know Padley Gorge in in the fog is an awesome place to be for backlighting. So if (laughs) if your shadow is is being cast onto your cap where your camera is, you know that you are blocking it, blocking the direct light from the camera, from the torch hitting your camera. So yeah. So the the backlight was set up first. I took up position. Chris exposes, turns the camera on, exposed for say 10 seconds, lens cap on, rotate the camera 180 degrees, lens cap off for 10 seconds, lens cap back on, rotate the camera 180 degrees. So we're back to where we started again. And then move on to the blade rotations and um, yeah, make it sound so easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Practice beautiful. makes perfect. It's like those right? uh, people you see on YouTube taking guns apart and putting them back together with a blindfold on. It's exactly right? the same. So it's just sort of muscle memory and doing something that much that it is just sort of second nature. Right. Mm-hmm. What what uh what inspires or motivates you through sharing your creative vision with the with the images that you create? Well, it, it it's probably more these days is going out with Chris into cool places. It's not always nice to catch up with him, and it, like the bonus sort of byproduct from it all is that I end up with some nice looking art at the end of it as well. So. It, it, these days, it's mainly that. Uh, back in the day when I was probably when I was doing my three six five projects, 
it that was my drive to because I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to. I didn't want to be one of those people who like does a three six five project and takes a picture of what they had for the tea, or you know, something like something dull almost. Um, I right. wanted to try and push myself myself at the same time and continue through doing the project. So it was it was probably that. And I like I, I do like all the interaction with other people. And obviously, I wouldn't be sat here talking to people from all over the world now if if I hadn't have sort of got into it in the first place. So, yeah, a bit of all of those things, really. But the creative outlet is is super important because it's a, it, as you probably well know, it's a good way to disengage your brain from the cycle of thinking about whatever negative stuff might be going on in your life. Like you get your right. camera out, turn the lights off, and all that nonsense that probably isn't even worth worrying about dissipates, and you just focus on what you're doing. Right. Well, you do it very well, my friend. Well, you're very kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> how how can we, you know, for those that don't know you, how can we follow along with you? Do you have any links that we can share in the comments um, just so other people can look at more of your work? Uh, uh, what am I? So, um, Fade to Black LP on Flickr. So that was where, that's where all my 365 projects have gone on there. So I've got like 2,000 pictures on there, I think. So. There's, there's enough to get your teeth into. Uh, and then um, on Insta, uh, that is fade to black light art, but in between each word is an underscore. And yeah, Perfect. Or, or Facebook, fade to black light art, or Tim Gamble is, is my birth name. Um, I'm, I'm going to throw your image back up here real quick. And um is there anybody that has any questions for Tim or, you know, either about this particular image or some of his other work you'd like to ask him? I just wanted to say uh, two things. Number one, I put a couple of links in the group as we've been talking to like a camera rotation tutorial and uh, the optical Nirvana group. And then I'll put Tim's links in there as well. But Tim, you, you showed a couple images uh, prior to us getting started of kind of your process of walking through. Can you share those? Now, yeah, yeah, Close, that? Mate, that no cool. worries. if I can, uh, if I can find him, oh. all right. So, there's the fur, so there's the, the image from this evening. Uh, let's full screen it if that makes it better. Um, so that was the first one that I did. I got, uh, I think I got sixth in the International Light Painting Awards for this one, so I was uh, super proud of that. But it's still based on the same process of the original, of the base part of the image that I shared earlier, but with a gel swap in between. Uh, this one was, again, same spot. I'm stood on the same boulder. Um, but this one, I've decided to put a flare in the middle because there was nothing really in the middle of interest. And then obviously my favourite uh, black fibre optics for the outer. So I did. I, I cam. Uh, I rotate the fat. I put the cam. Uh, the fiber optics in front of the camera and rotate it so you get a nice, nice points of light that seem almost to be emanating from that light in the middle. Um, so that was the first image that I took on the night in question of the picture we were talking about tonight, uh, which was just the backlit silhouette. And as you can see, the outside of the frame is pretty dull. In the middle of the frame, there's not a right lot going on at all, apart from backlit fog um so then i changed the exposures up a bit uh with the help of obviously chris thompson my best light painting buddy uh and i did i did uh the up and down with my so i stand off to one side up and down and up and down whilst chris is rotating the camera with the lens cap off and then i took two steps to my right and then did the same thing again just to give a bit more interest this one came out all right because in the middle the the trees the, the tree element in the middle the rotated trees made quite a cool pattern uh, and then i ended up taking the gel off the backlight and then putting the the rotated gel uh in the middle and then around the outer and then the little green splodges you can see is the uh glow in the dark tape off my tripod leg but that was just a happy accident 
So yeah, there we go. <laughs> Good stuff, man. Thank you. I think we had a we had a comment in here. Um, what what was the flashlight that you used? Uh, so for the blade rotation, oh, come here. So for the middle element, obviously it, you need a strobing. Well, you don't need; it doesn't have to be. But I like using a strobing oh. torch, and I've got the Rias Lightworks edition that he very kind, kindly gave to me when he came and visited a few years back. So this has got like uh, variable strobe frequencies on it and stuff like that. I don't really, I just put it on the brightest and the fastest and that'll, that does, um, that does me. So that obviously into the universal connector. I, I also put an orange filter attachment and then the Johnny Griffin blade in. And then, uh, yeah, you can't really see it strobing on it. Um, but yeah, so that, that basically, oh, I push myself back. That basically on the rig that I showed you earlier moves around like that in a perfect circle. And then I turn it off. Chris rotates the camera by seven turns on the camera rotation tool. Turn it on, rotate it again all the way around. Turn it off. Chris rotates the camera. So this then go all the way nine separate times. And then you end up with that ball in the middle. Um, so it, that's the, the simplify as I, I realize that it, some people might still be like scratching their head saying what well, I, I don't understand what you're on about, but I, there's only, there's only so much, there's only so much that words can do. <laughs> right. Hey, hey, Dan, uh, did you, I, I saw your comment about the uh, rotation tool. Do you, do you got an example you're talking about? Yeah, sure thing. My uh, my first rotation tool, I got one of the last ones that the Thompsons made. I talked Alan into making one for me and uh, recently gifted it to Johnny, right? If memory yep. serves. I've got so, it in collection. What we've got these days. So uh, Jules um, uh, had a rotating head here and attached one of these to it. Um, and then you tilt the tar tripod down. It was kind of off center and a bit heavy. So I added a second element here. But this is basically just an L bracket with an Arca Swiss mount. And then you mount a rotator head to it. And these have little notches in here. If you listen, let's see. Can you hear the clicks? Yeah, you can hear it. Um, so each click, you know, it'll click at different intervals here. But you can just order these parts on Amazon. So I've got two L brackets and one rotator head. And this one um, is just a little bit beefier. It's a different rotation head. but. Um, yeah, same concept. Good stuff, man. Thank you for sharing that. I just have one last question for Tim. How long was that exposure? Uh, four, wrote it down, 413 seconds, that one. Wow. Whatever that is, I don't know. My maths is useless. <laughs> Tim, I've got a question regarding the focus, the refocusing. Because obviously you've, you've done the, the initial shot where you're standing on the rock. Mm -hmm. um, where you're focused on that point. With regards to the, the center rotation and the side rotations, do you refocus the camera or is it done? Yeah, so I, I, I set up the backlit silhouette part first mm -hmm. because I can replicate that part easily because the backlight yeah. doesn't move from where it is. The boulder I'm going to stand on doesn't move and my camera doesn't move. So that that isn't a variable sort of thing that won't change but the positioning of the blade of the blade i need to start with that element otherwise i wouldn't because i had to plunk the tripod down in front with the blade on i have to do it in that direction so i i i focus on what the boulder on which i was stood which was probably not far off infinity really for that element take note of what that is, but then I'll plonk this rig down with the blade on top, which was say, I don't know, probably two or three feet away from the camera. Focus right. on that first. That Then I know that part's in focus. Once we've done all the blade rotation element, Chris recaps the lens, make sure we're in perfect like orientation again for the next element, and then just 
change focus back to like near infinity, I think it was. Okay, so, so you I always same... kind of go on. Sorry, so you, you you do the side you do the, the the side elements you do at the same time as the as, as the, the middle the... rotation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, yeah. I, I yeah, kind of work that. sort of back to front. I work out the I work out the bit I'm going to do second first because yeah. that that usually is the element that won't change. Um, yeah. Okay. Whereas plonking down a tripod at a specific distance from my camera to rotate the blade and focus on that sort of blind, as it were, is far harder to do yeah. than focusing yeah. on a specific place where I know I'm going to be stood. Okay, no, that, that makes perfect sense. Thanks for that. Cool. No worries, no worries. Well, Tim, man, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, it is a pleasure to have you with us this evening and do that image breakdown. Um, you know, I admire your work, and I know a lot of people do. So, thank what you very much. Well, thank, thank you for having me. Much yeah, appreciated, absolutely. mate. Nice to meet you as well, mate. Thank you. You too. Mm -hmm. um, so, next up this evening, we've got uh, Dan Roberts uh, there in Colorado. Um, he's going to be doing a segment on mosaic light painting. Um, so, welcome, Dan. How are you doing this evening? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, you're another one. Uh, very, you, you know, what you uh, contribute to the light painting community is, is awesome, and it's a pleasure to have you here this evening as well. Um, did you want to go ahead and screen share at this time or, or introduce yourself first? Yeah. Um, well, first I'll mention I've got a couple people behind me. One is a light painting brushes ambassador. How are you doing? <laughs> Aaron Simmons <laughs> and Chuck Taylor, who's joining us tonight um, with the light painting group for the first time. So um, good deal. Um, yeah, I've been at this about nine years. A couple things I've touched. I used to write for Light Painting Blog, um, started Light Painting Lab on Facebook, um, got the Colorado group going, um, built a video light painting system called Light Monster, which is available at thelightmonster.com. It's free open source. It's a little tricky to work with, but it does video light painting. Um, built lightpainters.com, which is a bit stagnant right now. And uh, just try to help, you know, I don't do this for a career, most of us don't. So we just wanna see the knowledge that we have get passed on and help other people make cool art. So I'm just gonna show a couple pictures here and we'll just blast through these right quick. Okay, there we go. So if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to pipe in. Otherwise uh, I will just go through these, oops, there we go. So these are a couple from the last couple of years here. I like highly technical shots, the same kind that Tim described where, how did you make that? And there's probably 10 or 12 light painters in the world that are my target audience. <laughs> Tim's one of them, <laughs> Johnny's another. But like pictures like this where they're all done in camera and people just don't even believe it. So um, some of you might recognize this guy as Dennis Calvert came up to visit last year, but, uh, yeah, good times. And, um, uh, this is one I did recently with a camera rotation as well. And, uh, this one I want to mention just because I teamed up with Frodo, he did the light in the back from Madrid. And we did a Zoom call and I projected his light onto a giant screen behind Reagan. And so I let her capture this in my camera, but he did all the backlight in Spain. So that is uh, awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. That was kind of neat. All right. So there's a quick taste of what I've been up to. I also do body painting as well. Okay. So uh, I guess that's the intro. Yeah. Um, so you, we're going to talk about mosaic light painting night. So do you want to go ahead and, and tell us what exactly is mosaic light painting? Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, a mosaic image is created from, it's one big picture. It's created from lots of small pictures. And early on, I'd seen the work of Brian Matthew Hart, and he had done a lot using these little fishing bobbers. And I talked him into telling me his secret. And I, I used those as well when I got started. And then Chris Bauer in the early days had done a couple as well. And he took it off. Um, he's been a madman with it lately. It's been amazing. But um, he'd only done one, I think, by the time I'd seen that. So you take a picture, you chop it up into 
some kind of grid pattern, you light paint any individual piece of it, and then you put all the pieces back together. So you don't get to say that the entire shot was not done in Photoshop because you're obviously putting it back together in post, but every individual piece of the mosaic is its own separate light painting. So I had done early on, I'd done a sunflower, I had done the Denver Broncos logo, the Avalanche logo, uh, Jason Page, you remember from when we had the uh, light painting brushes logo competition, I had done a mosaic for that one as well. So um, that's what, kind of it in a nutshell. Is, what inspired the idea of bringing people together to create, you know, uh, um, light paintings together as, as a community with the mosaic pieces? Um, so I'm actually going to go back just a second there. I had written some software to help myself make mosaics and I, I would give it a picture and have it chop it up. And as I painted them, I had some software that was monitoring a folder on my computer and I could say, assign this picture to this square. And that was pretty cool. But then I decided that I could build a system that, uh, we could, take tiles like that and let people download a couple and reassign them. And uh, I built a system called peaceout.com, that's P-I-E-C-E, because -E, you're taking a picture and you're piecing it out and letting people download uh, one, light paint it, and then upload it again and it would reassemble the whole thing. Now, after I had built this, I was talking with Sergey from uh, Light Painting World Alliance and he was trying to pull some stuff together for the International Day of Light. A lot of stuff went down that year and um, we thought what well, was a good way to get people involved from all over the world and being able to, we, we, uh, he and I talked about doing a piece together. We, we looked at some Picasso pieces, stuff that was old enough to be, you know, a little bit public domain. And we ended up uh, picking Van Gogh's Starry Night and we chopped that one up. So here, I'm going to open this up here. So there's the Peace Out logo. And this is kind of the process. We take a source picture, we chop it up into a grid, and then you come to the site and let's say, I wanna look get one specific tile, and it gives you this piece. And then you take your hand at trying to light paint this piece. Now, obviously it's not gonna be exactly perfect, but that's part of the joy of, of the mosaics as well. Your blue isn't necessarily gonna match but that's okay because when it all comes together, it's like this patchwork quilt of art and it's got a lot of character to it. And then these pieces get put back together and you can see here, this is an image of a few of the pieces have started to be reassembled, each of these little squares and the rest of the source image hasn't happened yet. And then here's a, oops, there we go, somewhere in there. This is people that, um, we're contributing to the project. This is, you know, maybe a third of the way done or 20% or whatever. And then this was the final piece for what we did. We ended up having 50 artists from 20 countries. We had over 450 pictures in this image. And, you know, at a glance, you go, hey, I know what that is. And that's kind of cool. But it's a piece that the whole light painting community from all over the world got to contribute to. Yeah, that, that is awesome. What, what, what light painting tools or gear would, would someone that wants to be involved, um, you know, creating one of these title, tile pieces uh, to contribute to one of these, these images? Like, what, what would they need to, to do that? So I'm going to zoom in on this real quick. And you can see that these are all just light painting. So anything that you can create a light painting with is a, val a valid tool. Now, the one that you're going to find the most useful, because if you look at these, these are all squares. The one you're going to find the most useful is kind of having some kind of, um, you know, I, I cut a square out of black uh, cardboard or construction paper or whatever. So you have a reference for where your square image is. And if you looked at the other image back here, you know, a few people, like there's Chris Bauer working on one of his. He's got this square cut out of the cardboard. So you know, you've got your references and you're gonna crop the, your, that image to that square and that's what you're gonna to submit to the mosaic. But other than that, I mean, these are just light paintings. People, uh, you can draw with fiber optic brushes or some people had um, like uh, 
color gels. I mean, anything that you can create light paintings with. I mean, I'm talking to people who light paint here. So anything that you know how to use is, is legit. Right. Uh, what, what, what is your vision for where do you want to see these projects go when you, when you like bringing people together, like where would you like to see this involved into? Well, we started a project um, just about two years ago and it was with light painting brushes and also light painting paradise and ball of light. We were going to give away a prize to, you know, someone who contributed to this image. And this was a source image I made. And as we started to work on this particular piece, we saw COVID levels dropping and then people stopped working on the piece and COVID came back. So I'm pretty convinced that if we want to eliminate COVID from the world, we have to finish this piece. So right. <laughs> where we're at right now is we've got 324 of 560 pieces done. So there's the source image and this is where we are right now. So that's kind of cool. We're, uh, we're getting there. And I want to show you what the interface looks like. So peaceout.com. What I want is for people to use this system. And originally when I built this, I thought maybe I'd, you know, let somebody uh, put up their own source image or on a project for like five bucks or whatever. This is just going to be free, but I want people to use this tool if they think it's going to be useful. So you can go here, down here. Uh, you can say request pieces, give me six pieces. Um, over here, you can see this is the source image. This is the tile you have to recreate. And if you look down here, you know, these are some of the ones that I've done myself. And, um, you know, on this last piece, you know, that's a very easy piece right here. So is that one. But when it all comes together, you get a very satisfying output. So I'd love for people to try this themselves. Um, obviously the biggest challenge is putting it back together, but that's where something like Peace Out works. Um, Chris Bauer actually prints his out and physically assembles printed squares and then varnishes over it. I've got four of his pieces here in the house and um, he, he puts so much work into those mad props to him for that. But where I want to see it go is let's finish this piece. Let's eliminate COVID. And uh, <laughs> then uh, if you want to do your own mosaics, feel free to use the site. Yeah, and, and I mean, is the way you have the site set up, it's so easy for anyone to go on there and just download an image and, and you know, recreate that and submit it and be part of something that, that's pretty cool. Uh, it is. I want, to point out, and, I want to point out one thing here, too. You see where it says click to download? You can download this image. But if since most of the time when you're drawing these, you're actually looking at the camera. So you have the option here to download a, a mirror image of it as well. So you're basically painting the image but it's already flipped. So when you're looking at the picture or looking at the camera, it's going to capture what you're supposed to be drawing and you'll be good to go there. Good stuff. Does anybody, uh, anybody have any questions for Dan about mosaic or the project and piece it out or anything like that? I just think it's freaking awesome. <laughs> I don't really have any questions about absolutely. it, but I think it's, absolutely awesome that you have brought the community together and in such a creative and cool way, man, to create that platform for everyone to work together. I just think it's great. Thanks. When uh, I'm an IT guy by trade, so I like finding ways to make technology meet my art. And that's where Light Monster came from. It's where Peace Out came from. And uh, I went to school for applied physics. So I love, you know, trying to make sciencey stuff happen too. But that's what I like about light painting too, is you've got people who come from a dance photography background and they're bringing their piece to it. And someone else is coming from, uh, you know, whatever they're coming from, they're all bringing different pieces. So I'm happy to contribute my piece. Thank you very much, man. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll definitely make sure we get that, uh, um, the link up in the comments there. And, you know, hopefully, uh, I would love to, to be involved with this and, and do some of these tiles. So, um, yeah, I'd love to see this project come together and, and, and complete this uh, this piece right here. So yeah, Jason, let me, show you, let me show you one thing. I for for this um, Starry Night one, I wanted to see. See, this piece here is not very wonderful. I wanted to see if I just sat down and I threw one take of thirty seconds at a given tile. I did ten tiles like that, and it, we still got to the finish line. 
And when you looked at the giant starry night piece, you didn't go, Oh wow. That one particular piece out of 400 really sucks. Um, <laughs> so as long as it's even kind of close, it plays well. So what I'm, I'm saying is don't be daunted by, wow, I'm contributing to this group piece. The idea is you've got a small piece of the whole and add your light, man. Good stuff, man. Well, is there anything else you want to share with us about it? Um, if, if not, you know, thank you so much and what you contribute to the light painting community. Um, this is, this is great stuff, man. So, and, and especially, you know, coming on tonight with us and, um, getting everybody and encouraging everybody to, to want to be involved with something like this. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. If you're in the Colorado area, look us up. We've got a really active light painting group, which is pretty wonderful. Good for the spirits. Um, and yeah, follow us at coloradolightpainting.com or my stuff at hackthelight.com and also hack the light on Instagram and Facebook. I'd just like to add, Dan is, like I said, just his peace out project is great, but he contributes so much stuff to this community. And Absolutely. Yeah, one of the things that I really love that he did is the map that is on lightpainters.com where you can search out other artists to work with and stuff like that. All that stuff is, uh, it'll all be there in the, uh, in the chat. And then once this goes up on YouTube or whatever, we'll put links to all this stuff. But yeah, there it is. There's the map right there. It's just, it's awesome. Sweet. Well, thanks, Jason. Yeah, man. All right. Well, thanks again, Dan. I really appreciate you, man. You bet, man. All right. So next up, we have Johnny Griffin. Um, he's going to do his tool segment for us this evening. Um, so, Johnny, how you doing? I'm here, brother. All right. What's well, all yours, man? All right. Uh, really, you know, we did the edge shaping and we did edge dressing. So we're going to kind of move into the face of the blade. But I'm not really going to go through. I mean, there's so many ways that you can decorate the face. It would be kind of just little pieces of, of, of stuff. There's uh, Paige is going to put some links in the uh, description on the video where uh, I think Reinhardt, you did uh, around the house where you did the window gels attached to the face blade for coloration. Uh, I know LPB has uh, chalk markers and I think you did one on four different ways of changing the face of the blade. So I think what I want to do instead of a how to do is uh, what not to do and what to kind of think about when you're when you're decorating the blade of the face or the face of the blade, like this, for example, bubble wrap looks like it would make a really, really cool blade, right? So you stick it onto it and you go to work. And what you wind up with, let me see if I can get this to work here, is this. None of the bubbles show up. And the reason they don't is because it's not making first contact with the light conduit. The, uh, let me see. But just because it didn't work doesn't mean you can't use the idea. So what I did here is I took a chalk marker and wherever a little bubble was at, added a little white dot. Now I'm in direct contact with the plexiglass, so it allows the light to make direct contact and it releases energy. Then you end up, let me see here, stop this dang thing. Hopping back and forth with these screen shares is kind of interesting. All right, let's see. With the little pokey dots, what you wind up with is full texture. So if you come up with an idea and kind of the whole point of what I wanted to show that is if you get an idea and you throw something on and it doesn't work the way you originally thought it should, just rethink it. You know, think of different ways that you can add with that chalk marker on there. I can add different texture lines. Uh, you know, last, last month we did the blackout where we did the little flower thing. The direct contact, this is a conduit for light where we diffuse it. You're interrupting the light, it's releasing the energy. But through the blade itself, it's not. So you had to make direct contact with the conduit, okay? You can also etch in, and that's kind of, that's a little more tricky. Uh, 
back in 2018 when we met up at your place for the uh, Mid-Atlantic. Uh, Paige had me do these little jobs. Now this is etched in LPB logo. Okay, really kind of neat little trick, right? That'll light up and uh, you can do etchings. Let's say you wanted to work with a diamond blade, but you wanted to give it some character. Oh, see, I've etched a one inch line. Now I've got a little duality to the single blade, okay? Now this particular one, I took to a trophy shop. If you know of a trophy shop that does the acrylic trophies, they can etch the name in, they can etch your blades as well. But now that's a permanent change to the blade. Here recently, I've kind of gotten away from the permanent etchings because if I take that blade there, take one of the factory blades that's not been matched with at all, Let's get a light to light this up. I take my chalk marker. I can come in here. Let's see if I can turn that to where it'll really light up. Well, edge versus drawing. So if you want to add character to your blade, instead of painting the blade and doing all the colors and swipes, simplify it. Use the use markers and stuff like that to etch out your blade to give you some character in your deal. Okay. Now, let's see here. Something else that's kind of neat or uh, some food for thought when you are coloring your blades. These here locked into the holders. All right, his movement. Two blades sitting here. I've got this one painted vertical and this one here horizontal. If when I'm painting, if I'm pulling the blade laterally, this is just going to turn white because I'm going to mix this pink with this yellow, with this green, with this blue. Where if I'm doing a side to side sweep, I've got them separated, okay? So when you're coloring your blade, think of your movement as to which way you're gonna lay out your coloration, okay? All those, keep little things like that in mind and you can add intentional detail, I guess you would call it. Now, if you're doing pulls or you're doing straight streaks, not too big of, a, not too big of an issue, but you can add character in with stuff you do intentionally, accidental, I love accidental, I do a lot of random stuff, but some things I wanna do on purpose and give some thought to the blade itself, all right? Cleanups. There's nothing worse on the face of your blade than wiping it off. This uh, liquid chalk that's on here has been here for a few days. All the water's evaporated out of it. If I take a dry cloth now and I try to rub that off, basically I'm sanding the face of the blade. And over time, you'll start clouding up the blade. So whenever you do your cleanup, use some liquid, clean it off with as, le with as little abrasion as you can possibly muster, all right? You wanna keep the blade pristine. There's enough stuff with the liquid chalk and the gels. Um, after Wes had asked me a question last month about putting tape around the blade before you put apply a permanent marker. So after we got off the deal, I actually did a search. There are clean release, clear scotch tapes that don't leave residue. And I would definitely recommend that. You know, so do, a little, do some research and think through your, uh, when you're dealing with the face of the blade and you're seeing all these techniques online that where somebody's, tape stuff on it or glued stuff on it or painted on it before you actually do so do a little research about removing it and if it's something that's going to stain or scar look for a simple alternative just think your way through them okay that's it for the face of the blade but i always want to leave you with a technique okay 
I don't want to just give you food for thought. This is a technique that I've really not seen anybody use. It's something I used several years back. Matter of fact, Mr. Reinhardt there makes this claim that the blade I'm about to show you is the greatest Johnny Griffin blade ever made. I don't know why he thinks that, but for some reason he does. Okay. Um, it's pretty neat, but that blade was not intended to be waved around. But that blade, yeah, I see you throwing it up there. But I don't know if everybody else can. <laughs> what that blade's truly for, all right, it's kind of like our LPB logo blade here, all right? It's for a technique called shadow casting. And what shadow casting is, is literally just that. Let me get this here toned down. It's actually casting a shadow onto the wall. We project light, we block light, but we can also cast a, a floating shadow. And it actually turns out pretty neat. Now, as far as uh, you know, your first look at it, it's gonna look something like this. And we wonder why we give Reinhardt the big head. However, okay. if it's strategically placed, you can do some pretty cool light painting tricks with it as well. Now, Reinhardt's actually holding the blade on this one. That's why you see the white everywhere. If I was actually shooting a model, I would be standing behind the model, projecting the, the shadow to the wall. Okay. Now, this particular blade was done at the trophy shop uh, using the laser etcher. But... There is an at-home version of it, okay? And what the at-home version is are transparency films. for You can get it for inkjet or a laser jet, okay? You can actually take and make a clip art, like, for example, uh, here with our fearless leader. There's Mr. Page with a simple projection. Now, one thing that matters on projection, size matters, okay? I've got a little bitty one here and I got a little bit bigger one here. All right, if I project the smaller one, I need to be up tight and close to my wall or whatever I'm doing. If I don't, the further I get, the more fuzzy it gets. If I try to blow that up to this size, my projected image is a little bit fuzzy, where with the big one, I can get the same, whoops, well, I was going to say I could get the same, but I just dropped it and I don't know where it went. All right, so it don't matter. Anyway, now, how to make those clip arts with photos are kind of kind of fun. And to show you how to do it, I am going to hop back over to my screen share and we're going to use the light painter's nightmare, Mr. Photoshop. This here is our <laughs> little guest speaker there, Mr. Dan. And yes, I asked him ahead of time if I could use this image and he'd give me the okay for it. All right, I've just opened up the image. I'm gonna go over here to this background lock and I'm gonna unlock the image. Oops, there we go. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna desaturate the image on, now I don't know how the Mac commands work. So this is all for the IBM clones for the PCs, but for a PC to desaturate, control, shift, and U will desaturate it. Control J will duplicate the image over here on our layers window. I'm going to invert that image by hitting Control I. And then in my blend mode, just above here in the layers window, I'm going to drop it down to color dodge. Then I'm going to add a filter. I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to add a Gaussian blur. And what that does is it gives me kind of a line art, line, art, line art version of it. And what I want to do is I want to adjust the blur to where I've got good sharp lines, but not enough that I'm clouding out the image. All right, so I'm going to say about right here will give me 
a little bit of detail or quite a bit of detail enough I can see who I'm working with. In fact, I'm gonna bump it up just a little bit more, do it about, run about eight on the blur. All right, okay, that. Then I'm gonna hit Control Shift E, merge the layers together. And with the uh, lock unlocked, I should be able to get the transparency out of here. Go up here and get my quick select tool. All the stuff on the outside of my image, I'm gonna go ahead and select now. Here it cut off his ear, so I'm gonna hit Alt and clean, the, pick this back up. Get all the little details. And then Control X to get rid of that part of the background. Now I'm gonna select my magic wand, come over here and I'm gonna select the white part of the, of the image. So I've got all the grays and blacks selected and you can adjust your tolerance here if I kick this up to about 30 and do that again, I'm losing a lot of my detail. So you kind of have to balance your tolerance for the amount of detail you want. And I, and in our case on this image, we're gonna go, let's say about 10. Control X to delete all that out. Now I'm gonna go over here to my layer window, hit Control and click the picture, and that'll select all the elements left in. Now. We're not worried about gray and black or whatever. We want everything in there because we're going to paint it a solid black. Okay. At this point, we want to look and see if we can recognize who we're actually line arting. If you can recognize it, then the shadow will be recognizable. Okay. There's a lot of voids in here. So I think what I want to do is I want to come in here and add a stroke. And that'll give me some background to the, that'll thicken up my lines on my character. Now, why did it not? There we go. That's better. There we go. Now, see, we're starting to thicken everything up. I'm going to add another layer, hit Control Shift E to merge them so I can get rid of the effects and make it part of the layer. And then from here, I can just print it. Well, make sure my printer's on. Print. All right, now I can adjust inside here to get kind of the size of caster I want. And print. That shouldn't take very long to print that out. Oh. Johnny. Yeah. Like the whole the whole room like squirmed and, and started getting antsy the minute when it Photoshop jumped up. So I know I figured Photoshop I'd tighten a whole bunch, a bunch of light painters. And <laughs> but I'm building a tool. This is in tool building. Not right, in light right. Painting. I see it. Now you can take your scissors and trim this out, but I now have a ca a shadow cast of Brother Dan I can put on the wall. Can you stop sharing your screen so we can see that bigger? Oh, shoot. Yeah, let me, I, I forgot I was still on there. My bad. All right, now, can you, now can you see it? Da, 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 da. Nice. Now, when you're shadow casting, a couple of things you got to keep in mind is movement of the flashlight or of your target, either one, will blur it. Okay, so this is basically a snapshot, you know, uh, projection. Another thing you have to keep in mind is your casting shadow. So any light that you present over top of that is going to erase the shadow. When we were looking at uh, Reinhardt earlier, let me see. Yeah, this image here. Let me share that. Yeah, see on this image here, where I've got him where he's not in front of himself and you see it well, but the light, any light at all will start erasing. You can use that and blend and be real creative with it. You just had to keep it in mind to not wash it all the way out. Here we scattered laser so we would have light, but not enough to, to erase the shadow cast. Same here, we kind of kicked him off to the side and then here we had no light at all. All the light on the wall is the light from the flashlight you know, circling around 
the shadow cast image. Okay. So three ways you can do the shadow cast with uh, this stuff is etch it into the plastic, paint it onto the plastic using the uh, liquid chalk, or print a line art image and be able to cast that. Something else that's actually kind of neat if you're real creative with it is actually casting the blades themselves in increments. The shapes of the blade will also cast just a clean blade. You can use to cast different shapes, you know, along along an edge, but you're going to wash out, you know, again, you've got to realize you're casting a shadow. So you would have to do like a dot, a dot, a dot with those shapes inside of it and then put your model work. Like I said, you just got to be creative when you're playing with shadow casting. I, I, I see like, a, that's a what I had for the night. shadow casting rotation in the future. <laughs> anyway, that's what I had for tonight. That's good stuff, Johnny. Does anybody have any questions for him? Yeah, I'm gonna, Johnny. I've got a fourth way you can use that last one on the transparency. Yeah. Um, when I started, I was playing with stencils, but you could take one of those printed, you know, transparency things and put it inside like a cardboard box and actually put a handheld like speed light or a strobe in there, right. and then maybe block black out the edges so you don't get as much cast. You're just getting the internal part. But then right. that'd be really easy to just pop really crisp shadow cast images anywhere you want to. Yeah. Yeah, and you could you could actually control the amount of light coming through a box like that too. And because it's so fast, you don't have to worry about hand motion on either of the pieces, right? Or the sensor. Right. Well, actually, you could almost kind of get away with doing that with just an open flash snooded, or you know, same principle. But instead of the flashlight, use a pop flash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would work real well. Yeah, good idea. But anyway, they're all food for thought. That's really, I mean, more than. I don't like teaching technique because techniques end up getting copied, but ideas are unlimited. You know, and that's really, that's really what, you know, the whole point of, of my segments of these are is just to give you some ideas to work with and make your own and be creative. But, Absolutely. That's good stuff, man. All right. All right. Thank you, Johnny. Yes, sir. All right, so next up, uh, let me screen share here. I'm going to go ahead and do some shout outs. Uh, there's, there's been some really good work um, popping up in the group lately. And um, Christina, man, just where she has taken this whole technique and just these, uh, Jason, what did she say? What did what she call these? Do you remember? Oh, I think we oh, asked. Creative last Creatures. Time. Creative, that's right. But what, creatures, where she's come from to what she's doing now, just with these templates, and man, and just this unicorn plexi up here on the top, which is just fantastic. I wish she was here with us this evening, but um, just some great stuff she, she's been doing. And these just keep getting better and better. Uh, next up, Vernon Jones. I just thought this was so cool, man. Just this, uh, this pattern, this technique, whatever this is, and there's a lot, lot to go. I like to, you know, take a technique and it'll look cool and I'll just build from it. Like what Tim was saying, you know, you, you've got, it's like a recipe. You've got a lot of stuff in your, that, that you, you know, in your arsenal and you just, uh, you just build on it and build on it and create. And this is a template for something that can be just awesome. And, and you know, the simplicity of it as it is, is really cool. So just wanted to shout out um, Vernon there. Dell George, he's been contributing some really good stuff into the group. Thought this was really neat. There's a lot going on here. Um, a lot of setup and just some cool blade work back here behind the Jason. <laughs> he didn't catch that, but was that you? Was that you modeling, Jason? Yeah, that's me. Right, I, I thought so, man. <laughs> uh, but just just cool. Uh, like I said, he's been contributing some really cool stuff and. Um, here he is again. Um, I, I like this particular pattern. Um, it was unique. I like seeing new unique patterns. And, and again, you can develop and grow so much from this and incorporate it in a lot of different themes and elements. And uh, this is good work, Dale. 
Uh, Rafi, uh, I know this is a collaborated image um, with Dan Roberts and Aaron. Um, the first thing when I saw this image is I, I, I uh, thought of the Eternals. That movie is so cool. And just uh, just this is, has that internal image here um, element to it. It's a beautiful, beautiful white painting. Um, just everything about it just grabs you. So this was was some awesome work. Dan, do you want to want to share anything else about that night? Or Aaron? Um, this was Rafi's first time shooting with um, anybody, really. And I mean, right. I think we all know once you start shooting with people, you learn so much so fast and the ideas grow. And he was like a kid in a candy store that night. And he'll be joining us tonight as well with one of his friends. But no, we just, well, actually, I will share one thing. Yeah. Um, we had three separate cameras side by side. And one of the things I'd love to talk about and maybe another time if, is the idea of live remixing group light paintings. And what we were doing is each of our three cameras, we had a different treatment on. So for some of them, I had a prism and then I'd give the prism to him for another part of the shot. So we had three cameras capturing the same thing at the same moment. And we ended up with three completely different shots. So we were just kind of, you know, goofing around and had some fun, made some cool pictures. Love how, um, how soft it is up here. Just that, that light is so soft, but it's uh, it's a beautiful image, man. You guys, you guys did a great one there. Thanks. Um, I thought, where's my, I thought I had a note. Hold on a second. You, you zoomed in. <laughs> you got to zoom out. What's that? You were there zoomed we in. Oh, that's what I did. Okay. I was like, what in the world? Um, I ain't even going to start even attempt to pronounce this guy's name, but this is really cool. Uh, just that dragon is so awesome. And just, uh, I'd love to know more about this image, but I thought it was, uh, it was really neat to uh, see this in the group and thought that was definitely worth, worth shouting out this person. I so. think Jay, I think that one is actually, I think that I could be completely wrong, but I think that dragon is like on a shirt or something that he light painted like the shirt. I remember yeah, him saying that. What yeah. they said, one of the yeah. descriptions said it was a shirt that he had painted the face on the shirt and then moved the shirt. And right, and yeah. Shirt, I mean, it was really cool how he laid that out. It is super cool. Yeah, it is. Uh, again, yeah, just that dragon is just pretty, pretty awesome, and just uh, this was worth worth sharing. So, uh, Daniel, he'll actually be with us next week. He's going to do an image breakdown. We've got an image that, that he's going to, uh, be sharing with us. Um, but this is beautiful portrait. Love the symmetry with the, uh, with the blade there. So this is, this is great work. And then last, boy, uh, he recently shared this, um, really cool. Just loved how it's the orb is split there in that tunnel and, um, it's, it's beautiful, nice colors there, nice nice hues. So beautiful work with the gold behind there. Just wanted to shout shout Roy out there. So um, that is it. Let me stop sharing here. Hey Jason, can I share one more picture? I stopped one picture short of where I wanted to, but you mentioned, oh, absolutely. You mentioned the Eternals. And yeah. this one is um, one that I did this week that I was really extra proud of. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. This is, yeah. So this one's Absolutely. Captain Marvel, but it's a body yeah. paint. And then uh, I just used white tool, like with this textured fabric with the light to make the, the power streaks and L wire. And then um, Frodo's scanner DKL to light her. And then the homemade fireworks tool for the around. But right. uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that one. There, There's that softness again. I don't, can you go back to that image? Oh yeah, gladly. Well, the images are using the same light tool to light the model too. So maybe it's the. Uh, so there's that at the top the here. There's this soft, just the soft hue on the light, and and it's it's very unique. And I haven't, I have it hasn't stood out to me before, but for some reason lately I've been seeing it a lot more in, in what you've been sharing. But there's this this just softness to the light mm -hmm. that is casting like a hue, and it's really neat. You're talking about these streaks down the side, kind of like that. Yeah, but on the outside of the light, it's kind of just like there's just this this hue, like a like a soft uh, blurring hue. Um, right. I can tell you. I, I don't know. Tell, some... I'll tell you the how. It's just a crumpled up piece of textured fabric with lots of fine holes in it. 
I've got the light in the right. other hand. I'm going like that, but because it's not a sharp edge or anything, you get that really soft uh, edge bleed. Gotcha. Okay. Dan, somebody it's beautiful, wants, man. Hey, Dan, Stacy wants to know about your homemade fireworks tool. Um, do you have it there? I, I can go get it. If you guys want to chat for thirty seconds, I'll be right back. Cool. Yeah, I mean, does anybody have uh, any questions for Johnny, what he's talked about? You know, Tim, uh, myself, Jason. Um, yeah, just feel free to chime in, and we'll wait for Dan to come back here in a second. Aaron, you want to jump in and say anything? Sure. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Man, great it's... great to see you, man. How's, how's Colorado treating you? I love it here. It's nice and sunny yeah, right man. now. It was a little, a little cold um, like a week ago, right? Yeah. But I like your uh, like painting shirt you got on. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I actually just found a site to make some hats. So I got some hats okay. coming. I'm excited to see how that, that turns out. But uh, oh, here we go. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I've got two things I'm going to show you here. Am I... You got me big on the screen there? Okay. So my fireworks brush, this one is my water version. Um, but it's basically at the dollar store, they have these little concrete things you can hold down helium balloons or something as a table centerpiece. And hmm. so there's blue and there's green and there's silver and it's attached to a universal connector. You shine it through and you shake it. Uh, the fireworks one, I didn't find it really quickly here, but it was the same thing with just silver and red. But as you shake it, you get these, you know, kind of unpredictable little cast off bits. And that soft light you're talking about, this is just tool. And I had a flashlight and I was kind of just going like this to do the soft edges. All right, good deal. Like I said, it was just something right, I recently uh, just honed in on and, and saw it a couple of times. So I just wanted to point it out. And it's really, it's really a, a beautiful um, technique. And then that texture is just really awesome. So I um, was just taking notice of that. Yeah. And the texture of that, that uh, fireworks brush, too, is it's one of my favorite. It's got a right. very liquid or fiery look to it, depending on the color. But I just All right. Well, with that, um, that's, that's another episode. Uh, we're, we'll be back. Um, we're actually going to have a pretty quick turnaround for April. Um, we're looking at April 9th, so we're going to put something together and um, have it soon um, here in the next couple weeks. So. Um, with that, thank you all to our guests, you know, Tim for being here, um, Dan for being here, Johnny uh, with another great segment. Um, so thank you all so much and everybody that participated tonight and, and joined along. And um, so thank you so much for, for being here.